I've got to confess to you right off the bat, um, you know, when I look at some really bright lights, aren't they? <laughs> um, when I became a, a Christian, many of you know my story, and I won't tell it again, but it was born out of the context of my father turning the other way and actually moving away from the Lord. And by God's grace, at the end of his life, at nearly 85 years of age, he had given his life to the Lord. But when I came to faith and my father went the other way, it forced me to understand the foundations of my faith. And then the early years of my faith were forged in things like apologetics and, and theology and historical theology and philosophy and these things. And and I, never, I will never regret those things. They created a foundation for me that by God's grace, I've had many struggles in my life, but one struggle I've not had is I've never struggled with giving up my faith because I know it's true. I'm convinced it's true. There are no other alternatives that even come close to surpassing the truth of our faith. And so for that, I'm thankful for all that I learned and studied. But out of that, uh, I grew up like a person who grew up missing a vitamin, or maybe you just don't realize what the effect of that is when you don't have vitamin K in your life, when you don't have vitamin D in your life, or you're deficient in it, and, and years later you find out, oh, that's why that vitamin's needed. See, and for me, there was so much of my understanding of God that was theological and philosophical, and I believed it, and I believed in my conversion, but there was, um, there was an imbalance in my life. And there was weaknesses in the Bible for me. Like there were certain books I loved, and I could walk you through it like as good as anything in my life. I loved Romans. I loved Galatians. I loved Genesis, particularly 1 to 11. Uh, I loved 1 Kings. I loved 2 Kings. I loved history. And I remember for years thinking, even when I was in seminary, I remember thinking, gosh, my weakest book in the Bible. If you've ever wondered about that, right? If you ever ask yourself, what's your weakest book? You get 66 to choose from. If you ask yourself, what's your weakest book? I used to always say to myself, my weakest book was Psalms. I just never read it much. And the reason was because it wasn't concrete enough for me. It wasn't analytical enough for me. I know some of you ladies out there are going, what's this guy talking about? That's the greatest book in the world. <laughs> but some of you guys know what I'm talking about. It was just, for whatever reason, it just I was never... That was never part of my formation early on. And so I've missed out. I was like a wobbly bike that just rode, and I just was missing out on a part of God. And I can honestly say today I just I spend my time in the Psalms. And part of that is because when you live a life that becomes so disrupted, when you realize that you've come to the end of yourself and you're not enough, not only that, but you're your, you're your own worst, worst enemy. And you can literally throw a grenade in your life and explode it. See? And all you have left is the God of the Psalms, the one who's compassionate, the Redeemer, the one who loves from everlasting to everlasting. See, now suddenly I begin to see things. And so... There's a psalm, it's, it's been called, uh, I think Spurgeon called it, it was called, uh, I think he called it that, uh, it's called the Mount Everest of the Psalms, and so that's the name of the sermon, is the Psalm of Everest. It's such a grand and beautiful and wonderful psalm, it's the peak, many will say, of all the psalms that are out there, that you can't even do justice. Uh, I've heard Psalm 103 preached, and it's, they do a good job, and I'm going to do okay but I'm not going to do better than David wrote it. See, because it's, it's that wonderful. Uh, there was a book a number of years ago that caught the Christian world by storm. I loved it. I read it during a time of, of uh, real brokenness in my life. And uh, the dedication, it's been, it's been called the greatest dedication ever written in a book. And it's a book, raise your hand if you've ever read. It was written in 1990. So if you haven't read it, get it. If you have read it, read it again. But it's a wonderful book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. Anybody, who's read The Ragamuffin Gospel? 
two of you. <laughs> Brennan Manning is the author of this book. Brennan Manning lived a very broken life, very powerful book. Here's the dedication. I'm going to read it to you. It's, it's worth listening to. I loved it because it so spoke to my life and, and what I thought and what God showed me. Right? Y'all ever been there? What you thought and then what God shows you? He writes, The ragamuffin gospel was written with a specific reading audience in mind. This book is not for the super spiritual it's not for the muscular Christians who have made John Wayne and not Jesus their hero. It's not for academics who would imprison Jesus in the ivory tower of exegesis. It is not for noisy, feel-good folks who manipulate Christianity into a naked appeal to emotion. It is not for hooded mystics who want magic in their religion. It is not for hallelujah Christians who live only on the mountaintop and have never visited the valley of desolation. It is not for the fearless and tearless. It is not for red-hot zealots who boast with the rich young ruler of the Gospels. All these commandments I have kept from my youth. It is not for the complacent who hoist over their shoulders a tote bag of honors, diplomas, and good works, actually believing they have it made. It is not for legalists who would rather surrender control of their souls to rules rather than run the risk of living in union with Jesus. If anyone is still reading along or listening, the ragamuffin gospel was written for the bedraggled, beat up, and burnt out. It is for the sorely burdened who are still shifting the heavy suitcase from one hand to the other. It is for the wobbly and weak need who know they don't have it all together and are too proud to accept the handout of amazing grace. It is for inconsistent, unsteady disciples whose cheese keeps falling off their cracker. It's my favorite line in there. Anybody have your cheese keep falling off your cracker? Has it happened, has it happened already today? It is for the poor the weak, sinful men and women with hereditary faults and limited talents. It is for earthen vessels who shuffle along on feet of clay. It is for the bent and the bruised who feel that their lives are a grave disappointment to God. It is for smart people who know they are stupid and honest disciples who admit they are scalawags. The ragamuffin gospel is a book I wrote for myself and anyone who has grown weary and discouraged along the way. Amen? See, uh, the ragamuffin gospel tapped into this nerve within the church. And the reason is because so many people were trying so hard to, to do it, to achieve it. And it's impossible. The Christian life is impossible apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And many of us have had to learn the, the very hard way. You know, when you think about it, if you want to sum up all of Christianity into one idea, it's this. It's God wanting to take our kingdom and our power and our glory and our strength, and he's wanting to, sub to substitute it for his kingdom and for his power and for his glory and for his strength. And here's the question. What does a life have to look like to exchange your kingdom, your power, your glory, and your strength for his? You think that's health, wealth, and prosperity? You think that's springtime every day? Or do you think it's going to be the difficulties of life? It's going to be failure. It's going to be struggle. It's going to be battling sin, battling temptation, battling a fallen world. See, those, those are the prerequisites to exchange our kingdom for his. And that was, that's been my path, very painful path along the way. And watching God honor his word and seeing more and more of who God truly is, the full picture with vitamin D, to see who he really is, has changed my, my enjoyment of God in a significant way. 
See, David was that guy. David was a ragamuffin dude. David was a guy that was called by God, chosen by God, protected by God, anointed by God, given all the gifts by God. He led him to victory by God. He was given everything by God. And suddenly, David, from the beginning, it was about God's kingdom. But as David grew in knowledge, stature, and success, suddenly David's kingdom became his kingdom. And David fell, fell mightily. And if it wasn't for David's falling, you would never have Psalm 103. You'd never have it. You'd never have Psalm 51, Psalm 32. You wouldn't have these psalms. They could only be written in the context of a man like David who saw God for who he truly was. There's an old saying that says, the broken are the truly bold. See, because when you're broken, you can fall at the feet of Jesus and weep and shed your tears on his, on his feet and dry his feet with your hair. That's what you do when you're broken, because you're bold. See, you can break a jar of perfume and you can break it on his feet. You can have your friends lower you on a pallet, digging a hole through a roof, begging to be healed, and doing whatever it takes, facing the shame of the religious leaders and saying, heal me. See, only the broken do that because they're bold. See, or in other words, they're bold because they're broken. Well, Look at Psalm 103 with me here. I want to just show you. We're obviously not going to hit the entire psalm, but I want to hit some highlights that I think you guys will really, really be blessed by. The psalm, um, it's, it's beautiful. It's laid out pretty simply. Verses 1 and 2 are, are, are the praise element of the psalm. 3 through 5 are what you call the promises, and you'll see what we mean by that. Look at verse 1 here. David says, My soul... Praise, and you may, your Bible may say the Lord. It's literally the word Yahweh. It's the covenant relationship-keeping God. My soul, praise Yahweh. All that is within me, praise his holy name. My soul, praise the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. David, after all that the Lord has done for him, David has to remind himself to praise the Lord and not forget the benefits that the Lord has bestowed upon him. Isn't that amazing? You know why David has to remind himself? Because we are a forgetful people. Who agrees with that, by the way? We are a forgetful people. That's why God, if you look at it, that's why God had to put so many things for remembrance throughout the scriptures. The Sabbath day was given so that we might remember God. Circumcision was given as a sign to the males of that community that they might remember God. Communion is given. Every time you do this, do this in what? Remembrance of me. God gives feasts and festivals and days so that we may never forget them because God knows that we are a forgetful people. A couple weeks ago, my wife and I were in Orlando, and we were actually doing a co-training all day long. And she was very nervous about this. It was her first one in front of a very large Fortune 100 company. And so she had just been praying, and I'd been praying. We'd been working together, all this stuff. And she ended up doing fantastic. So good that she actually took the client away from me. <laughs> Lost my first client. And I remember when we got done, I remember we, we got about, we got um, the, uh, the results back, and they were glowing. They were glowing results. She did fantastic. And do you know that it took two days after that for me to remember that I didn't thank the Lord for answering our prayers? Isn't that terrible? Like we cried out, God, be with us. God, speak through us. God, help us to have the courage, Right? Then it's answered. 48 hours later, I'm on I-35 driving. Hits me out of nowhere. Soul, remember the Lord. Remember his benefits, soul. Don't forget. See, your body doesn't forget food because what does your body do? It rumbles. It tells you when you're hungry. You never forget that you're hungry. Trust me. 
That's an easy one. See, when you're sad, your emotional life tells you when you're sad. You know when you need fellowship. You know when you need love. You know when you need encouragement. But it's so easy for one's soul to forget the Lord. Amen. That's right. It's so easy to forget the Lord. And David reminds himself. He says, soul, don't forget. Remember the benefits of the Lord. And you know what the benefits are? The benefits are beautiful. They're three, four, and five, verses three through five. These are the benefits of the Lord. They are what we call partial, but not fulfilled yet. I'll tell you what I mean by that. When you look at these, he forgives all your sins. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. How many of you right now do not feel like you are, your youth is renewed like the eagle? Anybody wake up with a bad back? Anybody aging not so well? Anybody struggling with some healings that you would long for for your body? Where's Jeff Tinch? You ready to get that thing off your neck? Where's he at? He's in the lobby, stretching his neck probably. See, God is the healing God, and he provides healing in this world. I believe that. There's not a doubt in my mind that God is a healing God. But God will be the perfectly healing God when we move from this kingdom to his kingdom in its final state. He is the one that provides all the healing, see? He is the one that forgives all of our sins. But they will be done away, and they will be cast as far as the east is from the west someday. Isn't that great? That day is coming. I remember I got a phone call once, and I was asked, hey, could you come speak to this philosophy course? It was at a university in Houston. The professor was an atheist and was a very antagonistic guy, and one of the students in this class had heard me speak at some event, and he asked his professor, if I could bring somebody to the classroom, would you let them give an alternative point of view? And the professor said, well, I'm not going to give them my class, but I'll have a conversation with them and let you guys hear the conversation. So it was, it was a conversational debate with this philosophy professor down there. And we get down there, and he says to me, um, Walter, welcome to our class. I, I, I want to give you just a few minutes to kind of make your presentation, but before you do that, I'd like to know just off the top of your head, can you give me a reason why you're a Christian? That was it. He, that's what he, he went right to it, right off the bat. Why are you a Christian? And I looked at him, and I said this to him. I said, his name was Andy. I said, Andy, let me ask you a question. As an atheist, if atheism is true, I'd like for you to tell the class right now what you can promise them. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you've got some promises. If atheism is true, there's certain things you can say, I promise you this is true. Would you please share with the class what those things are? And he was kind of evasive. And I said, for instance, could you say to your class that you can promise them that when they die, that's it? It's all over. There is no meaning. There's nothing beyond this life. Well, sure. Can you promise them? And I walked through all these things. Can, I said, can you promise them that there is no ultimate justice in this universe? That all the crimes against humanity, all the, the murders and genocides and rapes and tortures and all the things that go on, I said, in your worldview, you can promise them that all of that stuff will never be met with final justice. Can you promise them that? And it was beautiful. It was, that's why I'm telling the story. <laughs> and I said, if I could have a few minutes to tell your class what I can promise them. And I didn't quote Psalm 103, but today I could have. And I quoted them that I promise you that all of your sins can be forgiven. I promised them that they could have satisfaction and fulfillment in life beyond anything they could ever imagine. I promised them that someday there will be no more tears, no more suffering, that all of justice will be met. 
I, pr- I said, I can promise you that. And I said, which of these two worldviews do you students want to believe in? And then he says to me, well, Walter, that sounds all real good, but how do you know any of that's true? And then I said, well, I believe in the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so then we began to discuss it on the resurrection. You see my point? These are a set of promises that we have, that we hold on with great tenacity. Because this is what makes life livable to us. See, for God to be able to say that he forgives all your sins, not all but one, not all but the one last night, he forgives all your sins. From beginning to end. And how far does he cast those sins? As far as what? As far as the east is from the west. How far is that? Really far. (laughs) It's really far. See, that's the promise that he makes. He heals us of all of our diseases. See, in the Old Testament, and we don't have the time for this, but in the Old Testament, you will see that the, the picture of the disease of the body is, is almost always a representation of the sickness of the nation spiritually. If you want a, a cross-reference text, look at uh, Isaiah 1, I believe, verses uh, 4 and 5. You will see the nation described as a body full of wounds and sores, desperate for healing, and it's a spiritual healing that the nation wants. See, that is ultimately what he's talking about here. That man, this is a cross-reference in the New Testament, the man that came to Jesus who was paralyzed on a pallet, and they lowered him from the roof. Remember that story? They're lowering him. That would have been a trip. Big old hole dug in the roof. This guy's lowered on a pallet. He's laying on the ground on this pallet. And do you remember the first thing Jesus says? Many many think Jesus was alluding to Psalm 103. Remember the first thing he says to this guy? He says, your sins are forgiven. And the religious rulers, they were aghast. Do you remember what it says? It's one of the most powerful texts to show the deity and the divinity of Jesus. The self-recognition of his own deity. Don't let anybody tell you that it was hundreds of years later that that the church made Jesus into God. There was the self-recognition and proclamation of Jesus himself that he knew that he was the divine, that he was God. And it said, they were aghast because only who could forgive sins? Only God alone could forgive sins. And then Jesus says, beautiful. What's more difficult to say? Your sins are forgiven, or take up your pallet and walk. Which of those two is more difficult to say? Take up your pallet and walk. That's harder to say. Why? Because it's about to be proven. See, I can say to you, your sins are forgiven, and you'll never know if it's really true or not. But if I say to you, take up your pallet and walk, right? If that's the harder of the two, then what does that mean about the easier of the two? And Jesus says, rise, take up your pallet and walk. And the Greek says he jumped up and clicked his heels. (laughs) Grabbed his pallet and he ran. Could not believe it. And by virtue of the fact that he could have him take up his pallet and walk, what do you think that also meant? That he was able to also forgive him of his sins. See, that's Psalm 103. Your sins are forgiven. He heals your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. From the pit. Anyone ever been in the pit, by the way? The pit to the Jews. This is also the word that was used of Joseph being thrown in the pit. It's a metaphor used in the Psalms. It's a metaphor of being in a place in your life where you're absolutely stuck and you've got no one and nothing that can get you out but who? But God alone. Anyone ever been there, by the way, just out of curiosity? Or am I the only one? (laughs) When you are in the pit and there is nothing and no one that can get you out but God and contrition and time. See, 
It's the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. He promises. You're satisfied. This is the woman at the well. Give me a drink of water. Who are you, a Jew, to say to me, a Samaritan woman, go get me a drink of water? If you knew who asked you for a drink of water, you would say to me, right? Give me this water. I'll give you this water, and you will never thirst again. Show me where this well is so I never have to come back here again. Go and get your husband. I don't have a husband. You are right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands. And the man that you're living with now is not your husband. I perceive that you're a prophet. I should say so. (laughs) See? What was Jesus saying? The well that you're running to from person to relationship to person to relationship will never satisfy. Drink of the water that I give you and you will will never thirst again. You will be perfectly satisfied in me. See, that is a partial but not fulfilled promise because as Paul says in Romans 7, why do we continue to struggle and do what we don't want to do? What does he say? It's the law of what? the law of sin that dwells within me. Thankfully, there is no condemnation for who? For those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. But until the day comes that I'm finally transfixed, transformed into my spiritual body and rule and reign with him forever and ever, I will be carrying this body with me and I will always strive for satisfaction. I have it. It's partial, but it's not yet. Y'all there? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You wait. C.S. Lewis has this great piece where he talks about the aching of the heart. And that anybody ever just wait one time during the, you wake up one morning or sometime during the day, for what, whatever reason, you just have an aching in your heart. Raise your hand if you've ever felt the aching in your heart. Like this is, everything is great, but what, what is this aching? And the aching is like Augustine said, we are creatures made for, uh, 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 bound in time, made for eternity. And there's an aching that we feel. It's drawing us beyond this world. It's the longing for the fulfillment of the promises of God. Look what else he says. In 6 through 10, this is where he shows us our peace. The Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Now listen to this. He quotes Moses. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and rich in faithful love. Now that's Yahweh talking in Exodus 34. David leaves off the next line. You know what the next line says? but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. That's the next line. David leaves that off of this psalm. You know why? Moses writes around 1400 B.C., 1250 if you take the late dating, 1400 B.C. David's writing somewhere around 960 to 1000 B.C. David has a greater revelation knowledge of what's what's coming. David knows Somehow God is going to be able to provide a way to deliver us all from our sins. What is it? What's the answer? Isaiah gives it to you. What chapter do you think? Isaiah 53. Behold, all of us like sheep have what? Have gone astray. All of us have gone astray. And he was pierced for our transgressions. The iniquity of us all fell on him. Why did they fall on him? So that what? So that we now can experience the perfect peace of God in our lives. He takes on the full punishment. He takes on the guilt of us all. See, that's why when I look, when I look at all the other beliefs in the world, nothing compares. I asked this professor, Andy, I said, Andy, if I was to give this up today, what I believe, give me something to replace it with. 
I pleaded with him, give me something right now in front of your class. Give me something to replace it with. You know what he said? Quote, replace it with yourself. That was his answer. Is that a satisfying answer, by the way? I said, Andy, that doesn't work. People have been doing that for thousands of years, and it leads to suicide, depression, and despair. It doesn't work. See, that's the best he had. And here, David says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, rich in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. Verse 10, ready? I love this verse. Thank the Lord. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our offenses. You know why? The only way Psalm 103 can possibly make sense is it has to be fulfilled by the coming of Jesus. Jesus is the only way Psalm 103 makes sense. Otherwise, in a Jewish system of thinking, there's no way this makes sense. Because for every crime, for every sin, there was a punishment enacted by God. There's only one way that those crimes and punishments are done away. What is it? It is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Last couple of verses we'll look at. Verse 11. 11 to 14, this is the great pardon. This, by the way, is one of the great promises of God. It's the pardon that we've all been given. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him or for those who have reverence toward him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are, the King James, I always think it's funny, the King James says, for we are but dust. I remember thinking, that's weird. But dust. <laughs> we are dust. Sorry, it's a bad a joke I couldn't not say. <laughs> Look, he knows us. We are dust. We are, we are nothing apart from him. See, he is the one who has such immense compassion on all of us. Listen, there's no doubt in my mind, every one of us in this room struggle. If you have feet of clay, if you're flesh and blood, every one of us every day, it's a fight. It's a battle. It's pursuing him daily. It's laying aside the flesh. It's crucifying the flesh. It's counting the cost. Every one of us. And we have been given this amazing, amazing gift by God. If you know Jesus Christ, you have been given this amazing gift, and it is the pardon of God. And yet, the greatest tragedy of being given the pardon is to still live as slaves. You know, one of the, you guys, some of you know this. If you know your Texas history, some of you know when I say the, the word Juneteenth, some of you know what Juneteenth is. Shockingly, a lot don't. I asked several people this week, do you know what Juneteenth is? They didn't know what it is. Juneteenth is June 19th, celebrating June 19th, 1865. And it was the day that the slaves in Texas became aware of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, which was done, anybody remember? January 1, 1863. Abraham Lincoln, January 1st, 1863, signs the Emancipation Proclamation freeing all slaves. It didn't get to Texas until two and a half years later, until Union ships went to Galveston, the port of Galveston, and had to make an announcement and let everybody know that you were set free two and a half years ago. You've been living as slaves for two and a half years, and yet you have been set free. And we now have the celebration. I think 19, I can't remember the year, 1980 maybe, it was set as one of the celebration days of our state. June 19th is Juneteenth Day. It's the celebration of the emancipation of slaves in Texas. And I think 
What a tragedy. What a tragedy. If they had Twitter back then, they'd have probably done it right away. <laughs> it took two and a half years for people who were set free to live as free, but instead they lived as slaves. I don't need to interpret that too much, I don't think. But see, in the body of Christ, myself included, living under the yoke of slavery and bondage and works and all these things is corrupting to the heart. It's corrupting to the soul. There's no freedom. There's no power. There's no joy. And all of these are the great gifts that God has given us. Isn't that great? That's what he's given us. That is why I'm a Christian. They are promises that nothing compares with. And so every day, I get to remember. I get to remember what he has done for me, what he has done to take me out of my pit, what he has done to pardon me, what he has done to heal me, what he has done to satisfy me with his goodness, and the same for you. And look, if you're sitting here and you don't know Jesus Christ, I would implore you, to make today the day that you consider Jesus because he is the only one that can back those promises up.